Welcome, everyone, to episode 20 of Riders and Fighters, a podcast. I'm your host, AJ Ortega, and I'm just kind of a writer and kind of a fight fan, so each week I interview an author or I interview somebody who fights in some way. Today I interview Carla Hoke, a writer with a variety of fight experience, so I get to cover both topics of the podcast at length today. We cover a number of things like all the martial arts she's studied and practiced, her writing background, some basic writing advice in terms of fight scenes, and a number of other things. I do want to mention just really quickly that we do discuss a few things that may be uncomfortable for some listeners concerning inappropriate sexual contact in a gym setting and using self-defense techniques against violent and or sexual attacks in this episode. Uh, For instance, there's a a minute where I stumble through a personal story of unwanted sexual contact at a martial arts school. Uh, But for what it's worth, I think having Carla on the podcast was a good moment for me to say so out loud without any fear or judgment and all that. And she's a really fun person to talk to, very knowledgeable, not just about the physical nature of fighting, but also the emotional and psychological nature of fighting violence, self-defense, and so on. But before we get to that interview, I just want to recap a bit of that Saul Canelo Alvarez versus Billy Joe Saunders boxing match that was on the zone over the weekend. And so it was, uh, you know, Cinco de Mayo recently. And so the weekend before or after, depending on the, the calendar of that year, there's always boxing on, and specifically big Mexican stars. And you don't get bigger than Canelo Alvarez right now. I was glad that this fight got a bit of a buzz. And it's always around this time that a Mexican fight comes up with a big buzz. But it was weird that some people were saying that, and it's every time Canelo fights, people were saying that he fights nobodies and he picks his opponents and and all this stuff. And that's just really mostly, that's casual boxing fans not knowing the business of boxing or sometimes the history of the people he's fighting. Like, they're not just scrubs because you never heard of them. There are tons of pro fights every week all over the globe. But most people just watch a few times a year. And don't get me wrong, I want all boxing matches to be huge blockbuster events. I want them all to be super fights and dream matchups. But that that's never been the case, ever. And... It's not going to be the case now with somebody like the pound-for-pound best fighter in the boxing world. So about the fight, though, even before the fight, the ring entrance, Canelo's ring entrance, it was quite a production. But I think that's like the pageantry and the beauty of high-profile boxing fights. It builds up the anticipation and stuff like this. And I'm totally biased in that I love Canelo because I'm Mexican-American. In terms of my dual identity, I love that we, Mexicans, are good at boxing. Mexico has produced more world champions than any other country by a long shot. So seeing Canelo come out with mariachis and folklorico dancers and the beautiful colors and the flags, all this in a huge stadium where the Dallas Cowboys play, over 70,000 people, all of that was beautiful. Honestly, I got a little bit emotional. In that entrance, there was a musical group, a mariachi group, and they played a medley of Mexican classics. The song choice, like to kind of make an analogy for the audience, it'd be like, it's like reminiscent of old American country songs or folk songs that are like, you know, so old that like everybody plays them, everybody does a cover of them, things like that. In this case... The mariachi performers played Mexico Lindo y Querido, which is originally by Jorge Negrete, then a Vicente Fernandez song called El Rey, and then Viva Mexico, which was composed by Pedro Galindo, but several versions are played on days like Cinco de Mayo and Dieciséis de Septiembre. 
the entrance was great. It was beautiful. And to see the stadium again filled with people, lots of Mexicans and Mexican Americans or Latinos at large or just fight fans. It was really cool to see that on that scale. But there was a fight. There was a fight on. So enough about the entrance. There was a fight and the fight was a good one. Leading up to the fight, Billy Joe Saunders was talking a lot of smack. And that's, you know, to sell tickets. You know, I get it. And there was also drama about the size of the ring, which was agreed upon before, but was up in the air because I guess Canelo's team was trying to change it. I don't know the details, but it was a slightly larger ring than typical. And that was actually Saunders' preference. And it was agreed to. And it ends up being that way when the match happens. And so when the match starts, he does a really good job of utilizing that perimeter of the ring. Like, I think he had a few more feet than a typical ring. So that gives him more room to evade. And so I thought that was a, I mean, if you get a choice, why not? You know, you don't want to be in a phone booth with with Canelo. So let's make the ring as big as we can, you know. But round one was slow starting for Canelo. But this is when I saw what his game plan was, in part at least. Canelo threw very few punches in that round. But he was moving a lot. He was fainting a lot. And really quickly, a feint, F-E-I-N-T, that means a deceptive or distracting movement. Uh, It's French, comes from the world of fencing. You know, I look like I'm going to go right, but I actually go left to fake you out, right? And so Canelo is using the feint, like leading Saunders to duck or slip a punch that's never actually fired or comes from somewhere else, or like a typical one that you see boxers or MMA fighters do even is faint low and then go up top. Right? It looks like I'm going for the body, so you drop your hand or your elbow, and then I, I go for the top. Those kinds of things. And so Saunders had this habit of falling for a feint, and the way he would avoid this would leave him in a momentarily hunched over position, like as he's dodging or trying to dodge a punch, right? And usually that's a hook from either side. So you hunch over and kind of kind of duck it and you're good. But since he's a southpaw, he's a lefty. He's lefty. He, he fights, and, and Canelo's orthodox. And so they have opposite stances, right? Because of that, it makes him stick his face right there for an uppercut coming from the right hand of Canelo Alvarez. But Canelo's known, like most Mexicans, for the left hook to the body and the left hook up top. But in this round and in the next, I could see Canelo baiting Saunders with that feint. I even posted on social media about it. And then later, Canelo starts to to deploy that right uppercut. Again, going for that feint to set up that right uppercut. And he starts to do a little bit more in like rounds three and four, but he's like missing it for the most part. And so Saunders will take the bait, but get out of the way just in time. Or Canelo would miscalculate and didn't land it flush. He he did land one flush. uh, That's slightly wrong. He did land one great one in the early rounds. I forget what round it was, but it's the one that caught Saunders on the chin. Again, an upper, right upper on the chin, and it almost makes him lose his mouthpiece. It's like halfway out of his mouth. But still, in this match, Saunders is doing quite well. He's finding his rhythm, and he's landing good shots. And I gave a couple of the rounds to him easily, actually. I think he was more active and more accurate. Uh, And so he's not some jabroni they're just feeding to Canelo. Anyway, in round eight, we get to round eight, and this is, it's a fight at this point. And Canelo finally finds a home for that right uppercut. That feint leads him down and uppercut right on the the eye, the right eye of Saunders. And he's hurt. And Canelo plays it smart and keeps the pressure. He keeps the pressure, and Saunders is in trouble. But the round ends. And in the corner, though, he's sitting down in the corner, and he isn't allowed off his stool by his trainer because he, when he told his trainer that he can't see out of his right eye, they suspect stuff like a broken orbital bone. Like your eye socket might have a crack in it, right? Or shards of your bone came off. You know, it's the, the, the power that these guys generate is quite dangerous and your eyes are very delicate, okay? Like, I, mean, we, I panic if I get a eyelash or a piece of dust in my eye and this guy got a fist by one of the hardest punchers in the weight division if not the hardest and so they suspect that he's too injured to continue and subsequently the referee calls the match off right then and there before round nine can start so 
This is a TKO in round eight, technically. And people were giving Saunders flack about it, saying that he quit. But again, these are just truly uninformed people. And again, I'm not I'm not a boxing fan. I'm just a fight fan. That's all. I'm just somebody that watches boxing. But another round could end in blindness and lose his livelihood, right? Or take a few years off his eyes in the long run. And so instead, you know, you take that L and he goes to the hospital and hopefully fights another day. And so even if he was talking shit before, I know a lot of that is just to sell tickets and stuff like that. Um, But I just wish him a, a speedy recovery and that we see him in the ring down the road. So that was the main event which is all I'm going to cover for the sake of time, okay? Uh, so let's get to that interview. Let's get to that interview with Carla C. Hoke, author of Fight Right, How to Write Believable Fight Scenes. Enjoy. Hey, Carla, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, AJ? I'm hanging in there, hanging in there. So why don't you introduce yourself just really briefly for the audience, and uh, who are you mm-hmm. and what, what are you doing on my weird podcast? That's a good question. I wonder how you let some uh, riffraff in. Uh, I'm Carla. I am a writer and I'm also a fighter. I um, am a writer and instructor for Writer's Digest. I teach writers how to write fight scenes and I'm also a martial artsy. I love That's it. That's who I am. You know, I saw your, your Instagram and stuff like this and went up into a fightright.net and I was like, mm-hmm. wow, how did I not know of this? Uh, this is such a cool overall project and kind of this yeah. blending of you know your very uh, extensive martial arts experience and giving some giving some folks um pointers tips in terms of how do you craft fighting right. on the page and wh- i want to talk about all that stuff the 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 blog the podcast the book of course but uh-huh. first let's talk about that genesis of your martial arts fighting kind of experience. What was your first martial oh. arts you jumped into and when and stuff like that? It was, oh my gosh, it's been about 10 years ago now. Um, I, my kids were in Taekwondo and um, there was, they had a self, they offered self-defense at the Taekwondo school. And I was a writer at the time. I've been a writer for a long time. And I was about to write a fight scene and I had, I'm a lifelong athlete, but it was never, you know, com- combat arts in any way. And I thought, well, you know, I'll take a couple classes how hard is it to learn? I figured I'd take one or two self-defense classes and I would know all I needed to know to write a fight scene because how hard can it be? <laughs> right. And uh, I took the self-defense class and I got to be honest, it like freaked me out. It scared me to death. I didn't even, I didn't even join the class the first time. And I'm, I'm not really a timid person. I'm not, I'm an introvert, but I'm not shy at all. And, but it, it really intimidated me. So I watched the first one and then I did a little bit of the second one. And it just, it gave me a panic attack. It did because the instructor, I mean, he was a really good instructor. He would come Grab at you. you. Yeah. Yes. Which is how it should be. Uh, it's, that yeah. is how it should be. Sure. And um, it was hapkido based self-defense and it scared the poop out of me. And I thought, you know what? I got to keep doing this. If it scares me this bad, then there's a reason and I need to stay with it. And I did. And I was there for, oh, my gosh, I guess about six months in the class. And it got to where a lot of it was college students. So when the college students went all back to school, there would be some classes where it would just be me and maybe one or two other people. And I actually started picking it up. Surprisingly, I was surprised at myself. And the instructor said, why don't you do the MMA training class? And I laughed and I'm like, yeah, I'm 38. <laughs> I, I, there's, I'm not. He goes, well, you don't have to get in the cage. Just, you know, and I loved, I've been a fan of MMA way back before The Ultimate Fighter, you know, when it was just kind of showing and special stuff on TV while everybody said it was a blood sport, blah, blah, blah. I loved it. And so um, I joined the MMA training class and it nearly killed me. And when I first started, I would measure how tough the class was by how many times I vomited in my mouth. I'm not even joking. <laughs> sure. So I'd have a three vomit night. I'd have a two vomit night. Then it got down to a one vomit. And I'm not a puker. Yeah. So it, but it, I was always a runner. And so it's just a very different, you know, when you can't get your breathing in a cadence, it's a whole different game. That's how it all started. So that thus began the monster. When you say you were an athlete before, what sports or, or were you say oh, you're okay. a runner, but like what sports? And then you get into the self-defense class. And I want to talk about that distinction between sports where you're not 
punching each other, right. hurting each other. Did you, did, right. you, did you run like in, in like a track or something like that? Oh, yeah. Um, all through school, I uh, growing up, I was in track and cross country. Later in life, when I was a public school teacher, I was actually a track and cross country coach, but I was also a collegiate cheerleader. And then in college, I would play year round intramural. So I played flag football, softball, volleyball, basketball. Um, later, as an adult, I ran, I did triathlons, I played adult soccer. I'm a lifelong athlete. I've done just about, you know, one of everything. But in none of those sports do you have to face down an opponent. I right. think football may have been the closest because I was a uh, a running back and a safety. And so I was very well aware people were so coming action. for me. Yeah. Yes. People were actively coming at me and I was a small person. And so that was the closest. But yeah, until you have to look another person in a face and match will against will, it's just you don't really understand it. It is very different. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Even, you know, I always make the, the point that I didn't like team sports because I don't like having like my fate in other people's hands. Yeah, right? like true, the, yeah. Even if it's a W or an L, right, for, a, again, right. basketball, baseball, things like this. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, I, I like it to be whether I win or lose it once. I want it to be all me. But that comes with yeah. a lot of shock, right? Again, those, those first times you spar, that first time you're in a self-defense class, MMA training right. class. It is shocking. Yeah, it's up close it and is. personal, for sure. Yeah, it gave me a ton of anxiety. MMA is kind of how I got pushed in the direction of different martial arts as a whole, because it's a mixture of martial arts. You know, we may have Taekwondo one night, it may have been Judo another night and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai. And it it was an absolute shock to have somebody coming at me aggressively like that and it being okay. I mean, it's one thing, you know, when you're a kid and you get in a fight or something because, but this is like absolutely acceptable that this person is going to punch you in the face. And that was, it was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It gave me a lot of anxiety. I had anxiety attacks. No, I can understand that, sure, especially in uh, the self-defense class, which is, again, a very practical yes. thing. I recommend lots of people or everyone, really, at some point, go to a good school and and try it out. And, again, that it has to emulate, sadly, the reality right. of the things that we can face as people just in the world. And so, yeah, right. the, the the grabbing you from behind thing, the, the choking you thing, the pulling your hair thing, how do I get out of this? Right. And right. if we're doing it like – pretend and we're like then no. we're not ever going to learn anything you'll never be able to, to deploy that in an actual scenario if it doesn't make you uncomfortable you're in the wrong class and i actually teach self-defense now right. i went from right. being the scared person in self-defense class to to teaching it and that is something i say is look this is the place to get uncomfortable this is the place to feel unsafe because you need to work through all of that here in a place where you can control it before you get out in the world and it happens for real. So, yeah, I'm all about grabbing people by the hair and dragging them. Yeah, I am about, you know, jujitsu stuff, you know, somebody being in my guard and learning to get away from them. And so, yeah, yeah I think if in self-defense, it doesn't need to be like you watch King of the Hill. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I'm Hill? from Texas. You know okay. me. Come on, girl. Come on. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> there was a scene, there was an episode where their son went to a self-defense class, and the, ba- the main thing he learned was, stop, that's my purse. <laughs> and I love, that's my favorite episode. And if that's what your self-defense class is, you're, you're in the wrong self-defense class, and it's not one. You can't yeah. learn it in one. You need to keep going and keep going and keep going. I've seen some really good ones from the Gracie schools uh, that are mm-hmm. focused specifically for women, which I think is cool. And like yeah. really, I mean, just helpful shit like uh, close quarters stuff. Like they even have oh, videos on YouTube of like uh, right. being in a car. How do you get somebody off you if you're in a close quarters that way? Right. And it's like, wow, that's really good. So if you're listening and uh, if you're in a, a city that has a Gracie schools, check them out and see if they have a, a self-defense. Sometimes they'll do like one shot right. things on a weekend, stuff like that. So right. I, I always recommend people to do that. Um, and there so, was um, actually but, a study that came out by um, two psychologists named Grayson and Stein. I think it was university. It may have been Penn state, but um, they got a bunch of convicted violent offenders together. And individually they showed them CCTV footage of people walking down the street. And they asked them again in individually, who would you attack? And again and again, the people in isolation picked the same people again and again, and they did it in under seven seconds. Sure. And so the psychologist asked them, what was it about this person that made you pick him? Because it wasn't who they thought it would be. It wasn't always the little old lady. You know, it, it wasn't always the frail looking people. 
what they found and the, and the um, offenders really couldn't say, they're like, I don't know. I could just tell I could, I could attack this person. And what Grayson and Stein found is what all those people had in common was how they walked, Mm -hmm. how you walk sends a message to the world. If you are looking down at your phone, right. If you look uncomfortable, if you're shuffling your feet, if you're not making eye contact, those are all things that tell the world, um, I might be a gazelle rather than a lion. And, you know, when attackers come out, they're not they're not coming for a lion. They're coming for the weakest gazelle. And so you have to walk in a way that that says, I ain't your gazelle. Right. Period. No. And you project that and that unfortunately that, that that, you know, Predator and prey exists in our human Absolutely. species as well, sadly. Absolutely. So why train in so many different martial arts? So the mixed martial arts training, the MMA training, leads you into looking at all of these sports individually? Yeah. Yeah, I actually did. Um, it was a Taekwondo school. So um, the MMA program just wasn't wasn't as full as they wanted to be. I mean, there were students, but it wasn't enough for them to justify stay, keeping it. And so uh, I transitioned over to Taekwondo and they did separate the MMA class. They had Muay Thai style kickboxing. So it was Muay Thai, but we weren't wearing armbands. You know, there wasn't um, levels. And then they had Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well. And I stuck with Taekwondo for a while. I think I got to advanced blue. And then I was just like, this just doesn't fit me. I am a small person and I was quick, but um, people had the reach on me. And the thing that I always enjoyed the most about MMA was the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because it felt now I don't get me wrong. I love punching. I there. It is just so gratifying to punch. And if you don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. It is just I like I'm getting chills. It is just gratifying on a cellular level to just wail on a bag. Or a person. I mean, let's just get sure. realistic. Sure. But um, I felt like the ground was the equalizer for me. And and when we did start standing in MMA, which we generally did, unless we were having a jujitsu only class, my thing was to get these people to the ground as fast as I could because necks and legs are the great equalizer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, I went through Taekwondo and uh, Muay Thai style kickboxing and jujitsu, and I really wanted to transfer and do jujitsu full time. So I transferred to a jujitsu school and that jujitsu school also had Filipino martial arts, um, which is generally blade arts. People know it as Kali. It's not really a screamer, but it's stick fighting. And I, I personally went to the one that was the um, knife knife training. That's what fit into my schedule best. And I absolutely loved it. That's great. And I did that. And the instructor at the gym was trained in a wide swath of things. He knew um, street defense, which is self-defense guns and knives. He knew some Kung Fu. He uh, knew different weaponry. And so I just started paying him for fight lessons. And he was like, what do you want to cover? I said, whatever you want to cover is what I want to cover. And so I would show up and it would just be, hey, today we're going to try to crack a whip. I'm like, cool, I'm down (laughs) for that. And then I saw something for Aikido. And I thought, well, yeah, I'll I'll try Aikido. So my daughter and I did Aikido for a while. She kind of travels around, does stuff with me. And then uh, I did some judo. A friend of mine is a black belt in judo. And he did lessons with me and a a friend of mine. And I loved judo. Um, I would like to get back to judo eventually. But it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu that just, oh, and I also did some katana training. Oh, cool. While I was at the uh, Aikido school, it's a branch of Aikido called Iaido. Sure. And it's uh, katana based. But and um, but Brazilian jiu-jitsu is just the one that I keep coming back to. I'm absolutely in love with it. And it's the one that personally, with my personality and my, you know, history and everything, it's the one that has given me the most. And um, yeah, I'll no, I'll a great, be a jiu-jitsu forever. No, it has a great a great history. Again, mm-hmm. uh, uh, all these martial arts are just great to study culturally. I think just sure, so, absolutely. And that's I think one of the things that I will mention about the book is that you know the section where you talk about fighting styles and just giving people a little bit of those parameters of like this right. is where that's from and this is what you're looking at when you see this. Right. And, and so I, I right. think that's really cool. So you would say that BJJ is your favorite then. Oh, absolutely. Hands down. Yeah. Hands down. Followed closely by Muay Thai slash knife work. 
Cool. I really enjoy, uh, you know, judo too, though. I don't know. I will say that BJJ. Well, judo and BJJ are related, you know, so. They are the same. Look, it's yeah. the same. Yeah, it I hate to break it to you folks. Right. Yeah, yeah. If you go to a judo school and you say you do BJJ, they'll say that means basically just judo. Right. And that is where Brazilian Jiu Jitsu comes. It comes sure. from, you know, Maeda. That's how it got to the Gracies. And, and he started with judo. So they right. are a, a branches of the same family. For sure. For sure. And so would you say that, um, and you know, you're like a fight fan. Mm-hmm, like big time. Would you say that BJJ is the most helpful in those scenarios? In a self defense scenario? No, like a like a organized fight, or an MMA as a whole. Yeah, MMA. Oh, you know, I actually I'm I'm also a writer for Black Belt Magazine Jiu Jitsu, and last week I interviewed Greg Nelson, who is Rose Namajunas' mm-hmm. coach. And I think when it comes to MMA, if you focus, I mean, everybody comes in with a specialty, and that's something Greg mentioned. Sure. I said, you know, when you have a pro fighter come in, which is different than a brand new fighter, right. you know, I said, where do you go? And he goes, well, I I see what they focused on first. And then I try to fill in those gaps. So when it comes to MMA, you really have to be well-rounded. Yeah, you're going to have people that are wrestling specialists. You're going to have people that are jujitsu, Muay Thai. You know, Rose Namajunas actually was a Taekwondo person. Yeah. Um, I think you have to be well-rounded sure. because even if you're not, guess what? Your opponent might be. Would so you, you better learn. Would you say is this the same or similar for self-defense or if like I made you pick like, hey, I can only study one thing for a little while to defend my life. I'm That's on a such spot, a girl. tough one. <laughs> uh, on no, 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 no. I, I'm asked that. I'm asked that quite a bit. I would have to say it is a tie between boxing slash Muay Thai and jujitsu slash judo. And what I like about both of those is, and especially jujitsu is it, it demands people to get in your personal space. Right. And women, when we are approached aggressively, people intimidate with personal space. And so if you're in an art where somebody is always in your personal space, it kind of takes away others' ability to intimidate you by trying to take it from you. You know, and as far as Muay Thai and boxing, you're in somebody's personal space, you're looking them in the face. Yeah. I honestly, people have asked, what's the best martial art for it? First of all, any martial art you do is going to give you more confidence and it's going to make you walk taller. Mm -hmm. You just have to remember that that alone isn't enough. If you're walking out in the world thinking, bring it, you know, I'll (laughs) bust your tail, whoever you are, you're in the wrong sport. For sure. You are. And and that's something I loved about, you know, jujitsu is humbling. Muay Thai is humbling quick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, If you're not humble, you're not in the right gym. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That is right. You, it is a constant state of learning. So if you're walking out of your self-defense class or you're walking out of your gym thinking, bring it, everybody, I'll take on anybody, then, then you might need to consider focusing on something else. I, I, what, the one thing I like about those is it really opens your eyes to the world. You don't need to walk around terrified, obviously, but you also don't need to walk around ignorant. You need to be aware of, of the possibilities. Yeah, that reality of, of again, just yeah. that, that actual reality that violence, unfortunately, right. can be around the corner. Like, again, right. we see it happen to our, you know, people we love and things like this. And it's like, well, that's, you know, like, why not kind of put yourself in a position to not pad your head on a swivel completely, right? I don't think people need to be walking in fear, but like aware. No. There's a difference there. Right. You just be you aware. You need educated on it. Sure. Yeah. And, and honestly, when I teach self-defense, it depends. Some of it depends on the scenario. Um, I um, Before COVID, I, I taught out in College Station quite a bit, and um, I taught at a rape uh, crisis center. And at the rape crisis center, we did jujitsu cool. because those were women who needed to go ahead and have put somebody in their guard. And for those of you who aren't familiar with jujitsu, having someone in your guard is you have your legs wrapped around their waist on the ground. And that is, you know, a violent position that some of those women, God bless them, they had been in. And so I said, look, I know this is going to be uncomfortable. And if somebody wants to cry, I'll cry with you. But what I don't want us to do is not do this because you're scared. So let's just, so that is something I did specifically with them. And there were some women who were, you know, hesitant, which I worked with them personally. I am not an intimidating presence. I'm a very small person. Yeah, there are some situations where I definitely suggest doing a particular martial art, especially if it's one where you've had if you know, if you were raised in a household where people punched you, Mm -hmm. well, then you might need to go to Muay Thai and boxing, because if nothing else, you need to be able to stand up and look at yourself and say, you know what, I'm not scared of this anymore. 
this person will not have this power over me. No, and to use that in a way to again get a practical skill, but also right process a certain trauma yes, that absolutely that, like no more like fuck that I'm going to take agency of this right. and like giving right. these women this agency or people that have again. I got mugged and now I want to go learn how to box, like for example, right? Something Absolutely. like this. Something like that. It's like that gives people such confidence and true, like, you know, validation. Like, and yeah. And we need some of that and that, we do. that agency to, to be your own person and to be, you know, not have that trauma control you, but like, hey, I'm in control. My, my feeling is, you know, throw me to the wolves. I'll come back with a fur coat, bring it. And that is because I grew up in a home that was not safe. And that was part of what really scared me about self-defense. And I did not realize that there were things, again, I started at 38, I'm 48 now. At 38 years old, there were things from my history that I had not processed. And I did not realize it until a man came flying at my head. Sure. I'm like, whoa, this is something that I, I've, I've got to work out. And so that, that, that's personally how I did it. And it, it has given me so much, you know, sometimes, as I say, sometimes God does things for you. Sometimes he makes you do it because you need to look in the mirror at yourself and again, say, bring it. Yeah. You know, you cannot take this from me. You right. will not take this from me. In fact, give it to me and let's see what I give you back. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a smart way to look at it. I think it's a smart and also yeah. a compassionate way to look at it, too. Again, for yeah. something that is always maligned and looked at as violent and why and people don't get it and it's like no well, there's, this other, there's this other end of it that is compassionate is loving oh my gosh is yes. caring you know and Absolutely. it's hard for people to resolve that i mean it's hard for people to it let is. those both both ideas exist in their brain right you know? my best friend has been seeing me do jujitsu now for going on seven years and she is not a jujitsu person. She plays tennis, but she's gone to class with me and she says, I don't care how many times I see this. I, I never get used to it. And sometimes I'll be talking to her. She goes, have you noticed that when you talk about jujitsu, you could also kind of be talking about a porn. Yeah, no, <laughs> I was like, yeah. what? No, <laughs> she's exactly. like, well, the positions, you know? And I was like, well, yeah. And, and she said how, and, and that is something that people don't understand about jujitsu. How is it not sexual? Sure. And, and that is, I can't, I mean, obviously I can't speak for a man, but for a woman, that is something we, some people have to get past is this is not a sexual situation. It's an opponent in front of you. Right. Um, you know, and of course, are you going to have creepy people in jujitsu? Well, it's on earth. Yeah. So sure. sure you're going to have, have some creepy the, people. Basketball. Oh, court, you know? oh, sure. Yeah. Every at church, there could be creepy people in church. Yeah. But for the most part, I have to say that the men that I have worked at, worked with in jujitsu, 99% of them. Yeah, there's been a 1% who have been creepo jerks, but 99% of them have been generous and kind and protective. And there is something about trading sweat with somebody. And this is scientifically proven. Mm -hmm. You trade sweat with somebody, you, you gain an attachment to that person. And if any of those guys, which, you know, I may only see three times a week. If they knew that I was in danger in the parking lot, they'd be the first people out there. Sure. So, you know, it, it is, you develop a really, a really close camaraderie, but I can do, I can understand why people would look at jujitsu as like, eh, that's, yeah, it's that's too, kind close. Of too close. Well, again, it's it, the personal it thing. It's that, that it is. you know, some people get weirded out if you side hug them. And it's just like, oh shit, sorry, <laughs> right, your yes. space, I'm sorry. Exactly. You know? But then exactly. it's like, now we're sweaty and we're rolling and our geese stink and I have you, and, right. you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, and we're in this mounted position, which does look right. very sexual and stuff like this. And so, right. yeah, people, um, again, that not knowing what you're looking at kind of thing. Um, right. You your know, brain decides your personal space. I actually, I actually researched this and, and I, I wrote on it. Your brain, I mean, culture has an impact, but everyone's personal space is decided by their brain. And I, I've told people this in um, self-defense too. If you're ever talking to somebody who's really attractive and you get butterflies, that's actually a form of fight or flight. And when somebody gets into your bubble and like if you're talking to somebody and they're really close and you just can't think as well, it's because you've gone into fight or flight and you don't even realize it. Right. So if it's something that's created by your brain, you can rewire your brain. It's a very plastic organ. And yeah. so me personally, I didn't even like to be hugged before I went to jujitsu. I was really funny about people other than my kids. I was really sure. funny 
about people being in, uh, you know, my husband, obviously, if I have kids, I'm okay with my husband versus <laughs> face. But otherwise, I didn't like to be hugged. And, and I was able able to kind of rewire myself to where, you know, it really doesn't bother me anymore. You know, um, I don't know if I'm going to include this in the podcast, but I'm going to say it out loud. And this is like, so talking about that idea of personal space and the close quarters of uh, martial arts and the fact that there may be creeps there. Yeah. I remember going to my first martial arts class. It was a Kung Fu, Kung Fu school. And I only went once and I ended up going for years at another school close to my house. At that, uh, that first uh, school, I had this memory that there was not a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and there was only like two or three, like two people maybe. And there was an older gentleman there, not the instructor, but an older man, like man grown. I was like right. 14 or something. Oh, okay. and, I'm, and I'm practicing okay. like what they showed me a couple little moves for to, to st the beginning of a form, right? Kata, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and he's like, well, when you do this, you're, you know, you're emulating this, like, this is the punch. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And he's like, and when you do this, it was a tiger thing. And, he, and you, 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 uh, you kind of, uh, like claw backwards. And when he right. did that, he grabbed my hand and it's a groin attack. And he took my hand and like, I grabbed like, uh, you know, his junk is right there in gym shorts. Right. And I pull back yeah. immediately. And this is a big motherfucker. Right. And I'm skinny. I'm li right. I was little then. Right. And this is a big motherfucker. He was mm -hmm. a grown ass man and big, like fat, right. big, like, and I was like, yeah. and I pulled, and he saw that I pulled back. So whatever, I kind of went and did my own thing. He did his own thing. And I didn't really think about that till years later. And I think right. about like going to the other school and going through all my training and, and the martial yeah. arts and this kind of appreciation for the martial arts and things like that. And I wonder how much is rooted in that moment of like, holy shit, like that guy almost tried to yeah. try to pull something on me. Mm -hmm. And what if I wasn't like, what if I didn't pull away? What if I, right. was, what if I froze at that moment? And yep. so I think about that and, and again, never went back there. And one of those fleeting things that never had the conversation with my buddy that went to that school right. and continued right. to go, you know, we were in competing schools at that point. Fortunately, I got into a really good school and it really just right. changed my trajectory. The confidence thing. I have right. a really good radar for like, there's going to be a fight in about five seconds over there <laughs> that way. Right. Those kinds of yeah. things. I've always, right. uh, you know, where I, I know a lot of people that just don't have that radar. Right. And it does come from my training, but also that messed up experience, which, it, I yes. mean, and it, you know, sucks, but like, I've heard far worse, you know, and things like that. Right. And that. It puts your own brain on high alert. Right. It and does. I, and I wonder, like, ever since that moment, have I been on that high alert and a little bit more conscious of. Oh, whoa, absolutely. A bigger person around me. Oh, absolutely. Me. And like. Absolutely. Yeah. No question. There's a book called The Gift of Fear that every, by Gavin DeBecker, that everybody needs to read. And, and he talks about intuition and the feeling we have about things. And in the Western culture, we dismiss those feelings, like you knowing there's going to be a fight in five minutes. We dismiss that in the Western culture because we put it up to mysticism and everything. It's not mysticism. Our brain calls out information. We have information coming in at us all the time. We can see the tip of our nose when we look around the room, but our brain slides that information away because it needs to focus on certain things. It can't focus on everything at once. And something Gavin De Becker points out is sometimes your brain knows things it's not telling you. So if you have a feeling about something, there's a reason. And intuition is always right in two ways. Number one, it's there to protect you. Number two, it's coming from somewhere. It's either coming from the moment you're in or it's reminding you from a moment of your past. And so your brain may be on high alert for that sort of thing. And that's not a bad thing. It's only a bad thing when you can't live a normal life because of oh, it. Right. Sure. No, I think that's a great distinction. No, I think distinction it's great. There. I think, yeah. I think it's a great distinction. Yeah, weird, uncomfortable experience. But like and one that kind of, I think, kind of changed the, the, what my brain was doing. Sure. Uh, you know, for the better, and I it was safe and everything at the end of the day. But yeah, and you know that these martial arts exist to protect ourselves, so things like that don't happen, or you can mitigate it or something, right? Right, right. So, and it's also a, a rude awakening, you know, when you're that young to realize this is in the world, and you can't unlearn that. Oh yeah, you can't walk away and still feel like everything is great, everything is safe. Once you are, once you are introduced 
to something unsafe in your world, your whole matrix, your whole paradigm has changed. You look at everything differently. And, you know, that is something women, I don't know how often men experience it on the mat, but, you know, women, we experience it on the mat sometimes. I've been grabbed on the mat. I've had people behave inappropriately on the mat. And somebody asked me one time, have you been grabbed? And I was like, well, yeah. And they were like, well, maybe it was an accident. And I know they meant it in a kind way. They were trying to give the person the benefit of the doubt. And I wasn't, I wasn't calling out the person who had done it. I never did. They were a higher belt and it, it just, yeah. it, it upset me so much that I was just like, I'm just going to be quiet about this. But I told the guy who was a cop uh, uh-huh. that I was training with and he was like, well, maybe it was an accident. And I said, you know what? I know that you mean that well, but please don't insult a woman by saying right. that because I know the difference in somebody in Nogi who accidentally grabs my breast as an anchor sure. and keeps moving right. and somebody who lingers. Right. Right. We know the difference. Sure. We do. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So the blog, tell me about the blog. The blog came before the book. It did. Okay. It so, did. Tell me what was the impetus for that? I was a writer and I had started doing martial arts and uh, there was a fellow writer that I, Writers con- conferences are kind of like summer camp as you see the same people every year and you kind of catch up with each other. And there was a writer that uh, I kept up with and he knew that I had started doing MMA and then he knew I had done Muay Thai and I was like, well, you should do it too. And so he started doing a little Muay Thai and we saw each other at a conference and he said, you know, they're going to have a panel on fight scenes and a panel um, at a writer's conferences conference is when you have a group of professionals that sit on behind a table or on a stage or whatever and allow writers to ask them questions. You know, you may have a panel about the publishing world, how to get an agent, how to edit. And this panel was about writing fight scenes. And he said, he was one of the organizers at that time of the conference. And he said, would you be on a panel about fighting? And I said, why would I be on a panel about fighting? He goes, because we need somebody who's fought. Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Oh, oh, okay, I'll do that. And so I sat up there on the panel on the very end, on the very end chair, (laughs) and I was next to people who were for real writers. And I had a great deal of writing experience at that time. I'm a lifelong writer. I was a writer for a magazine and I had actually had written a book way back and um, I said, yeah, I'll do that. And there, a lot of the questions were directly punch based questions. Well, what happens when somebody gets punched in the nose? (laughs) Well, how do you get knocked out? What does it feel like to get knocked out? And people just kept asking these questions. And I thought, Mm -hmm. people have an interest in this. Okay, same conference the very next year. They said, hey, would you be willing to like do a demonstration? I said, of what? And they said, fight stuff. And I said, okay. And so there was a guy there at the conference who did martial arts. And so the people, I I was fairly well-rounded in my training and, and the writers would ask things. And I'm like, well, this is what you would do. Well, this is what you do. So I came off stage after that and I was approached by Quill Pen Editorial Services and they said, will you be our fight scene, court, fight scene editor? And I said, that's a job? And they said, yeah, it's a job. We need that. And actually the, um, the head editor at Quill Pen needed a fight scene edited and she sent it to me after that kind of to, you know, test me to see how I was, how I was doing. And she was like, holy cow, I didn't even realize, you know, these things weren't correct. And so I started thinking, well, I wonder if anybody would read a blog. And so um, I started the blog and I thought, you know, nobody's going to read this. It was just a little um, Google blog, blogger, blog, blog spot. And um, I got up to like 100 views and I thought, holy crap balls, this is a thing. People would actually read this and it got to be more and more. And then that same writer's conference that I had been on the panel with and that I had done a little demo with, they said, do you think you could teach a class? I'm like, heck yeah, I could teach a class. I didn't know if I could teach a class, but <laughs> yeah. I figure I'm not going to tell them no. I was a public school teacher for about a decade. So I know how to make a fool of myself in front of people comfortably. Oh, for sure. And, um, and then they asked, well, would you do mentoring with authors? And I said, sure. And so I went to a writer's conference and they had different mentoring, which was free, which is amazing that you can get a mentor with an agent or an editor for free. Cause you normally have to pay for that. And my scheduling slot filled up boom immediately. And they said, well, will you open more slots? I'm like, yeah. And I had no idea what these writers were going to ask me. 
And it it was just basic things, you know, that people don't know. They didn't know how to make a fist. They right. didn't know how to punch. And I've told people, you do not have to know how to fight to write a fight scene. Chuck Palahniuk, yeah. the writer of Fight Club, sure. he's not a fighter, but you need to know how the body is oriented. And I said, that's what's so important. You need to understand, like if I edited a fight scene where someone did a left-handed jab and then they did a spinning back kick with that front leg. And I said, that that's not the way to it's go the with that stance, because yeah. of how yeah it's the wrong stance I'm like oh i didn't even realize that and so the more i started you know working with authors um i thought i wonder if anybody would read a book and i thought well what would i even put in a book and i looked at the blog and i'm like heck i've got a whole book right <laughs> it's here. all my chapters here on the internet <laughs> yeah here's my chapters and so the book had most of it honestly had been written great and uh shockingly it got picked up by writer's digest shockingly so oh, here I am. Super cool, man. I, mm -hmm. I, I like that. It, it just happened so naturally. It did. It and did. That, and not that it's just, oh, right place, right time, but that you are qualified. You're like, well, you have a teaching background. You know how to write. You know how to fight. So right. can you teach? Well, yeah, of course I can. And you just figured I it out. I can do this. Yeah. 100%. Right. I like right. that. Right. And so one of the questions I have is... What are some of those common things that writers get wrong about fighting? Like that was an example, right? Okay, well, you threw this punch, right. but then they threw this kick. And it's like, well, that's not right. how you would do that. And I have right. my own versions of these that I've seen, again, because yeah. right. when it comes to car stuff, fighting stuff, like I can sniff out like if you're bullshitting. Like unfortunately, right. you can get past some right. people. but uh, And then I like admiring when people are like, that was a really good again fight scene yeah. or you really picked right. apart a mechanical task on a car really right. well what right. are those common things that riders may get wrong about fighting because they don't have it in their background or they're not plugged into it you know my husband is former military and anytime we see a movie and there's people in the back of a c-130 having a conversation he's like that's not a thing you can't <laughs> talk in the back of a c-130 um what i see most is just too much they just write too much. And I've told people, okay, pick out a scene and then only include the moves that you would see in a comic book panel. I said, you know, comic books and graphic novels are incredible resources for writers. Yeah, you know, a lot of times That's as great. writers, we, we watch movies. You know, we see something like John Wick, where mm -hmm. the fight scene goes on for five, ten, two hours. Sure. You know? Sure. Well, that's different because you're able to visually see that. But when when you're having to play it out in your head, it's much it's much more difficult. And so I've told them, look, when you look at a comic book, yeah, they have fight scenes and they only highlight the pivotal moves. And that might be a tiny move, you know, a tiny move like picking a lock. Well, that changes the whole scene. 100%. If they're picking a lock and the handcuffs behind their back, obviously that's something you need to show. But you don't need to show all the punches and in comic books what do you see you see the blood fly off of them you see their head thrown back you see the biff pow oof because more than anything people want the sensory experience not every reader is gonna understand the the fight that's going on as many martial arts if i i've done you know if there was a scene that was you know salat or um, certain types of kung, kung fu or some karate. I'm really not familiar with karate. Yeah. I, I I might question. I, I don't know. And so you you've got to consider your reader may not have the fighting background you do. And um, you know I, I bring up books like um, American Sniper. American Sniper. Um, obviously, people who are reading that book are are going to be fans of American Sniper. They're obviously you know they want to know something about him. He has a whole chapter, um, had a whole chapter, God bless, God rest his soul, about the type of guns he uses because people want to know. But here's the thing. That was a chapter in and of itself. Sure. So if you wanted to know more about his story rather than the gun he preferred, you can just skip that chapter. Right. So you've got to, I, I, I tell people, reach out of the same bu bucket of knowledge that your reader is in. If your reader does not know how to fight, can they follow this fight scene? So cut it down. I just edited a fight scene for somebody and I cut like several hundred words. Yeah, less is more. And I said, yeah, I said, I think you've done a great job. You've done too good a job. You've got to condense this. And, and I use Fight Club as a reference a lot when I, when I speak. Thank you, Chuck Palahniuk. In the, in the book Fight Club, 
there's not a ton of fight scenes. It surprises people. I think there's seven individual kind of fights, but it's actually only three major scenes. Okay. One of those scenes is a night at Fight Club, and there and it highlights three different fights, and it's less than twenty sentences. Sure, those three fight scenes because what Chuck Palahniuk does is he highlights what is most important and in words people can understand. It, there's one where a guy grabs his head and he said he held, cradled his head like a football. Well, that's a perfect visual in the United States. Yeah, and you don't have to know people, anything like, about fighting. You don't. Right. You don't. If you know about fighting, then you understand, oh, the person is behind him. But if you don't know about fighting, you at least understand, oh, he's holding it against his body. So, um, yeah, that's the main thing is cut it down, only highlight the moves that are pivotal to the scene, and put more of the emphasis on the sensory experience. It's like watching UFC from the couch. If you watch UFC from any fight from the couch, you have a better view of that fight than the fighters, the coaches. You have a you have a better view than the cameraman because the cameraman can only see one point of view at the time. You're getting to see all points of view. And so if you can see it that well, why the heck does anybody go to a live fight? Right. You go to a live fight because what you can't see on the couch, you feel sure. in the arena. It's like going to a live production of anything. And what you want is to take your reader off the couch, put them in the arena where they can smell the room and hear the people and, and feel everything that's going on around them. So really laser focus in on the sensory experience, because even though we can't, not everybody can relate to being hit in the face, everybody relates to pain. Right. So, you know, start, start from what your reader understands. I like the analogy of um, the way comic books handle fight scenes in that comic books are action packed. I mean, oftentimes Absolutely. they're about superheroes, which are, you know, right. superhuman fighters. And right. and so we're reading these comic books and, and uh, looking at the images and they economize the fighting and the violence by punctuating Absolutely. it with each panel. And so they have to. And right. so they showed the whole the whole fight for real it, every comic book wouldn't be you know you know three bucks and thin like this it'd be thick as hell it'd be you know it'd be too expensive yeah <laughs> you know comic books something people don't know about writers and comic books like people would say well, why didn't you put this in your book why didn't you put this in your book well that's because every there's a word count money. <laughs> it does there's a word count i had to adhere to and so bows and arrows and some medieval stuff i had to toss out because i had an eighty thousand and under 75 to 80,000 limit. And it was, it's the same thing with comic books. Every single page costs them money. Plus you have to take into account, okay, where are we going to put the call out? But I, I'm, I know a guy um, that does comic books. You have to, after you illustrate it, you got to make sure you still have room for the call out so that they have, you know, words and everything go with it. So real estate is prime in comic books and graphic novels. And that's why they highlight only what is most important. And we need as writers to, Take a cue from them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely. I think that's some of the that's some of the best uh, advice I've heard in terms of writing Thank those you. fight scenes and yeah, just less is more. You know, it you, is. you mentioned the gun stuff too, and I know there's a there's a bit of that in the book as well. Weapons, things, knives, Tiny guns. Um, again, right. just enough. It's not right. pages; it's just a few pages about right. just the fundamentals of a firearm. You know, again, right. I, I was reading a a story in a workshop one time and uh you know somebody it's it's a point that this person has never this character has you know never picked up a gun but in the climax of the story they grab the gun out of the drawer point it at the gun and shoot him and, and kill him and i'm like but doesn't that have any, any any external safeties like i have three firearms they all have different safeties and i'm right. I don't practice enough to even know like it, it's like how like they wouldn't be able to right. pull it off that quick that accurately i'm like that's just no. silly and, and I have are to say so. To use a firearm, and people I have to tell. So hesit- yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. All that stuff. That the yeah. reality of. I'm like, have reality. you been around a gun? Like, it's not. Okay, have you asked someone about? You don't have to touch one, and you can. It's a shock when those, you fire a gun. Sure. It the power is shocking. I think you know. Again, if you're, I, I recommend people people do it, even if you're not into it, because I think you need to understand mm-hmm. the power that they have. You know. And right. So, well, police officers and soldiers have to be conditioned to fire their gun at people. It's not a natural human state to go out and kill another person. And so if you have a character who has never shot a gun, first of all, it's going to be a whole lot heavier. Swords are lighter than people think. Guns are heavier than people think. And the first time you fire a gun, first of all, it scares the poop out of you. 
you're shocked at, at the power that comes out of it, Blinds you know, you. never yeah. mind. Yeah. Everything. The kickback, everything about it is just, it's a little, it's a moment of terror where you realize the, the power that it's you violent. have in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, and shooting another person leaves you with some mental issues. Sure. It absolutely does. Unless you are a psychopath, which in and of itself is a whole other mental issue. And that's something I write about in the book at how, um, you know, soldiers had to be conditioned to fighting. And in World War II, they were realizing it took like 90 something bullets per kill because people don't want to kill other people. It's oh, inherent to us. Yeah. 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 And they had to condition people. That is why if you uh, see any World War II documentaries on the History Channel and you see them shooting, look at the target. The target is round and, it, you know, with a hash mark in the middle. Okay. You fast forward forward to Korea and Vietnam, go look at those documentaries and you will see that the targets they're shooting at are in the shape of a human. And it's because they had to condition them to fire at another person. And when they did that, they did find that the bullets per kill went down. Even They even showed soldiers cartoons where Wiley Coyote catches the oh, road sure. runner. Oh, sure. And they yeah. have to. And that, you know, to this day, they sometimes um, different video game companies will let the military have first person shooters, you know, when they're out training and all that kind of stuff, because it does help. Yes, moms and dads, you heard me just say that uh, it does uh, help condition them. Yeah. Back in the early 2000s, I went to a E3, the big video game convention in L.A. Yeah. And uh, outside of the Staples Center, again, there's thousands and thousands of video game people right. in the industry and we're doing all this stuff. Outside, the U.S. Army had a tent where you could play video games. Absolutely. Uh, right? And so I'm like, there's – yeah, there's, that's a whole thing there for sure. It's a um, whole other podcast. And so yeah. the, uh, some of these historical things you're kind of mentioning and passing here, mm -hmm. I really like that at the end of these chapters you do have your kind of references for like this is where this information comes from. Absolutely. Um, I like that it's – it isn't like a how-to kind of thing. No. It isn't. This no. is like an education of – these different elements of fighting, right? The the physical body, um, what uh, knives and what did they do, and uh, gun handling, and, and the different types of guns, and uh, right. the different types of martial arts. It's a it's a really cool crash course, and the scope is pretty big. You know that you get mm -hmm. in the 200, 250 pages. Uh, mm -hmm. You cover a lot. You cover yeah. a lot, and, and I had professionals awesome. vet the material. I love your acknowledgement. I'm not going to trust yeah. me. Yeah, my and and these are big people in the industry, and there were times when they found problems with them. My gun chapter, um, there were a lot of things that got tweaked in the gun chapter oh, because that is not my area of specialty. And the reason somebody, um, I think there, I had a review or something that criticized that the there wasn't more gun stuff in it. And again, that's a person who does not understand how publishing works. Sure. But also, you know, if you are writing a crime novel that is super gun heavy, then my book isn't the book you need. Oh, you, no. you need something a little bit oh, different. A little bit heavier. But yeah. yeah. And, and people will ask, well, why don't you have a chapter on how to write a fight scene? And I've said, you can't, you can't Bob Ross it. That's something I, I tell people. If you don't know who Bob Ross is, he paints and you kind of follow along and you emulate what he does. Well, you're not creating a painting with Bob Ross. You're learning how to paint so that you can maybe later go and do it on your own. There's no one way to write a fight scene. I have a blog post that has a fight scene, Fight Club, Chuck Palahniuk, Orson Scott Card, and then uh, from, I think, the Twin Towers, um, Tolkien. And I juxtapose those, and I'm like, look how different these are. Are any of them wrong? No, these are all classics. That is why you cannot say this is the way to do things because every writer has their own voice. That's like saying when you walk into the cage, here is how you must fight. Uh, really? Because right. the Sanchez brothers blew that out of the water. Right. I mean, yeah, you got some people that fight and then you got the Sanchez will come in and slap the crap out of you. So, you know, it, it's just, and fighting and writing. Oh, my gosh, they're so similar. Oh, for sure. Everybody's fighting style is peculiar to them. Everybody's writing style is peculiar to them. So I, I don't ever want to stand up and say, here's exactly how you do it. Now, I do have little methods that I go through. I have something that's called the POW method, you know, to make sure you kind of include all things. The only thing I do say you absolutely need to do this is when you are blocking out a fight scene, you need to start with the injury and yeah. walk backwards. Yeah. Because yeah. even if that injury doesn't happen, that's how I'm moving so, you know, a, a fight scene where I'm going to shoot somebody is going to be very different than a fight scene where I'm going to stab somebody. Right. 
So you need to start with the intended injury and then go back from there. Yeah, I just think the the advice you gave is pretty pretty great. Well, and, thank and you. And just kind of you know orienting people in some of the language, some of the vocabulary and stuff, but really just the kind of frame of mind you have to think about when Absolutely. when you're writing these things and be a little a little calculated. I remember yeah. I remember one time one of my one of my stories was critiqued again by, and you'll you'll realize that this person had never been in a fight. I had a, a moment. I think the so again all, all my short stories again that end up being boxers or wrestlers or mechanics because those are the things I can make them do in the story and do it right. Well. And so there's a right. moment somebody you gets, write what you know. That's you it. Write it's, what a, you know. it's a simple uh, yeah. writing one hundred and one advice for sure. Right. And there's a scene where somebody gets popped in the nose of and uh, main character. It's a, he says that he he smells something metallic and then the blood starts gushing out, and they were yep. like, well, if he got his if if his nose is bleeding, like in, and he couldn't he wouldn't be able to smell anything because blood is in his nose and that's like liquid. And I'm like, <sighs> I want to hit you in the but face right do. now. So so it, there's a sensation. It's not even a smell. It's the the iron the the metallic. It's the taste. The it's taste. what goes. And I've pointed that out. What's coming out yes. in front of your nose is coming out the back too. That sensation. It. It's between smell yes. and taste, a hundred percent. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you've never had blood go down the back of your throat, and so you you clearly don't know this, right? Right. And. Uh, yeah, it's just those kind of little things are can be exposing, right? Yeah. Or, you know, either like, okay, I hit that right on, and people that have been hit in the face are like, yeah, that's totally how that feels. Or that yeah, that's how that works. Right. Right. You, your mm-hmm. eyes are going to water. You you know, like the toughest guy. His or eyes here's are yeah. Water. Or they knock <laughs> somebody out and they stay out for twenty minutes. <laughs> that like, ain't how that works. No, no. <laughs> 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 you better dead. watch out because he may be back on his feet in thirty seconds. Yeah. You never know. Right. And again, that sensation, like I've never been knocked out, but I've been not, I, I, I say I've been not goofy, right? Like I've been, not I've goofy. been punch drunk. I've, I've been but, punch drunk. And I'm like, whoa, like literal tunnel vision, like everything goes yep. away and I only see a little pinhole in the middle. Sparkles. Sparkles I got are sparkles. real. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mine look like static on a TV. That's how yes. mine, yeah. And, That's kind of how mine was. Yeah. And again, but like, I can't, I don't know what it's like to come up from being knocked out, you know? So well, yeah. you know, that's – and I didn't either. That's why I interviewed different people. Yeah, like I have a – Go to the experts. Uh, Bubba Bush. Yeah, I, I, Bubba Bush lives near me. He was an ex-UFC uh, fighter. And actually, he did a blog post for me on what it feels like to get knocked out. Wow. And it is – you lose time. Um, another guy that I interviewed is a Muay Thai fighter. He said when he gets hit really hard, there's been times when everything turned green Whoa. around him. Whoa. Yeah, I know. Um, but, y- you know, when you come to from a moment and, and I think it is a very different. Ex- I know it is getting knocked out from a punch and getting choked out in jujitsu. Sure. Totally different experiences. Sure. Totally different. And I- I've told people, I said, you know, it's not necessarily the punch that may and, and they assume, oh, you got knocked out. You got a concussion. Like, that's not why you get knocked out. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's just because it disrupts your blood pressure yeah. so quickly that your body, your brain's like get horizontal. But when you, you know, fall from being punched, that can be when you bust your head. That can be the problem. Whereas, you know, hop over to jujitsu, you get choked out and you wake up feeling like you've had the most refreshing nap. It is the weirdest <laughs> thing. And I don't suggest people do it. But I've, I've heard that friends somewhere that knocked, else before, I think. Yeah. Right? I had a friend who was knocked out in competition and, and she had two small kids at home. She's like, that was the best nap I have had in years, you know, and it was only, she was only out like five seconds, five, six seconds. Oh. So it is a very different experience. Yeah. 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 Tell me a little bit about uh you still doing like writing workshops and, and like getting groups of I do. Uh, together. And, I do. Um I am teaching like? um uh well I record classes for Writers Digest University. I'm I'm about to record a new series of classes for them. Um and I was teaching at their conference in New York, but it just got canceled because of the whole COVID yada yada. We didn't know if the hotel would be able to hold sure. us at the proper capacity. Um, but I'll be te- and so that may be online and I've done some um, teaching at writers workshops that are online, not the same, right. um, but I'll be teaching in person in St. Louis at the realm makers workshop. And I think the class I'm teaching then is um, a three part series on injuries and writing injuries and, you know, what they have to offer your book beyond just a band aid and a bloody nose. And then the next class is looking at injuries. Hey, this is what a gunshot wound looks like. This is what uh, damage from a serrated knife versus a a smooth edge knife looks like. And then the third day is where I stand up and they say, hey, my character's in this situation. What do I do? So that's the kind of stuff I teach. I absolutely love it. I'm a teacher at heart. I mean, that's what I went to college for. 
So I love teaching. No, I think those those workshops must be really great to kind of again dial so in those fun. things and yeah and 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 I think your book might also get writers that aren't plugged into the fight world like you are right. or even I am as somebody who watches and likes to you know read and talk right. about this stuff that it might open their eyes to be like hey they're they're passing on the TV and see you know the UFC on ABC and they can. You right. know, watch it and maybe kind of understand a little bit, you know, and, and not look at it as something that they can dismiss or something, you know. Oh, it's science. And I've tried to explain that to people. I was like, you know, boxing was called the sweet science, still called the sweet science. And there's a reason it's based in physics. When I uh, teach little kids about break falls, you know, I talk about science and I was like, who, who loves science? I'm like, here's why we do this. Here's why we put our uh, arms down on the mat like a bat. Here's why we tuck our, I, I tell little kids when they're first learning to break fall, you close yourself up like a little bat and you roll backwards like you're going through a hula hoop. And then we talk about slapping the floor. And, and I've talked about that when I've taught people how to punch, cause I've taught kickboxing too. I'm like, this is physics. This isn't about being strong. Punch is about mass times acceleration. If you're trying to punch hard, then you're not getting as much force as you could. You need to punch fast. And that is something that surprised writers. And I'm like, just be, you know, balling up your fist super hard and punching as hard as you can. That's not what creates force. It's relaxing, going as fast as you can and using proper techniques so you can get as much of your mass behind it as you can. So that is something I am very thankful for that writers who don't necessarily, not everybody wants to watch fighting. I get that. Um, they they do appreciate it because they see that it's not just people getting in and wailing on each other. It is a science and it is something that you have to really work out at there to me. And in, in my mind, there's a difference in ability and skill ability is, is what you're, you know, my ability, you and I were born with the ability to write. We have a natural inclination, but we have to learn the skill and that is something else I've told writers. I'm like, your character doesn't wake up one morning knowing how to fight. Right. That That's not a thing. It's not. Yes, yeah, some people are easier to teach, but nobody walks into the ring knowing the science of fighting. Right. Totally. Yeah, it's something you have to uh, – you might have some gifts here and there, but you have to develop those skills. And it takes a long a dang long time. time. And speaking of Holy long time, crap. you're a you're purple belt? G- yeah, I'm that's, purple that's, that's I've been a purple dope. belt about a year and a half. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So in, in a few years, you think you, you're gonna, you practice enough, and you're still gonna roll, still gonna be getting your rolls in and going up brown belt. I'm gonna still be doing it. Yep, I'm still gonna be in it. Um, I, you know, you try not to think about the belt. You do try really hard. And I came from a gym that does not stripe. Oh yeah. Um, when you go to a gym where there are stripes, and you're like, okay, I'm that much closer, and that much closer, and that much closer. When you don't have stripes, it's just like, hey, you'll get it when you get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Yeah. But, you know, I don't I don't care how long you've done jujitsu. I did not feel this way in any other martial art that I tried. None. With jujitsu, there's never a day that you think, I know all this. Not one right. day. I had a white belt. Or she may have been a blue belt. She was a blue belt. Say something to me which um, I've I've just changed gyms and they are a stripe gym. And so they're looking at me like, Oh, she just became a purple belt because I don't have any stripe. I've I've been a purple belt a year and a half. And you know, she's like, Oh, I just feel lost. And I'm like, welcome to jujitsu. I'm like, how long have you been doing this? And she goes two years. And I went, yeah. And she goes, well, how are you able to do this? How are you? I'm like, I've been doing this six and a half years. That's how I'm able to do it. I said, but guess what? I'm lost every day. I don't know what I'm doing. We're all just winging it. You know, and, and one time the coach, uh, he's like, we're all winging it. He goes, oh, we don't know what we're doing. You know, <laughs> and, and that it. is something that I love about jujitsu. It doesn't end. In the striking arts, yeah, in taekwondo, I got to a point where I knew all the strikes. Now, the combination that you put together, that is where um, the skill really comes in. But you never get to a point in jujitsu where you're like, yeah, I know all this. And especially now I, I've transferred to a school where there is a lot of wrestling. And so that's a whole new world. And I love it. I love it. Um, I love them. And that is something you're seeing more and more in jujitsu, especially like you watch ADCC or anything like that. There's so much more wrestling involved. So something I personally love about jujitsu is you're never going to know it all. Never. One thing I really liked in the, just one little small thing you just reminded me as you were talking, 
uh, in one of your chapters, you really quickly in a paragraph or two explained the distinction between Brazilian jiu-jitsu and wrestling, which, yes. again, to the untrained eye, looks similar. It's their, gra- they their, their grappling similar. sports on the ground, right? right. But right. the point of wrestling is to pin your opponent while in BJJ right. is, to, is for them to submit to you. And that's right. a huge distinction there. And so they're related right. in a certain regard. But I love that you pointed out that, that very simple distinction that right. uh, NCAA wrestlers, right, have good, good solid base and, and fundamentals crap, and stuff yes. like this. But yes. they're trained to pin an opponent rather than to have him say, I don't want any more. Big right. difference. And so there's right. And great. also, yeah, in wrestling, you don't work off your back. And so something I've noticed with with wrestlers now, I, I'm going to tell you what, I don't think. I think if you have a lot of wrestling experience, I don't know if you should enter BJJ as just a plain old white belt. Sure. <laughs> you don't understand BJJ standards, but I, uh, I was paired up. I visited a gym not long ago and I was paired up with a girl who's a brand new white belt. And I was like, well, you know how long? And and she was my height, but she outweighed me by a good 60, 60 pounds. Okay. And um, I said, well, you know how long you've been doing jujitsu? She's like, Oh, I just started. And I'm like, okay. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to take care of her. She's I'm single telling you, I re- oblivion. Oh, holy crap. Boss. <laughs> she, I reached out for her and she immediately got my, I think it's called a Russian hold on my arm and drove me into the ground. And I said, I tapped and I said, what the heck? And she goes, oh, I wrestled for like 16 years. I'm like, yeah, information I needed to know. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like that, that changes, that changes everything. But you know what? There's a different mindset too. Um, in wrestling, there's no stalling. In jujitsu, you know, you can hold somebody in your guard and just think, get a breath or think, okay, where do I need to go from here? You don't get to stall in wrestling. It's movement, movement, movement. And that's something I've noticed about this, this coach. Um, whenever I spar with him, dude never stops. Nice. There's never a point to where, you know, I get to catch my breath, which I really, I really enjoy that. And so the mindset of, wrestling and it's a little bit like this in, in judo is i'm going to dominate you yeah always looking for you, or dominant position yes. transition transition I, the transition from the wrestlers are great that scramble yes you are gonna do what i want you to do whereas jujitsu while you also have that dominant mindset there's a little bit of trickery at play right you know Baiting oh you come, and things like yes this. come this way there's no this isn't dangerous just just come right here <laughs> come and the next thing guard. you know you're choked out <laughs> yes it. come into my guard what could i possibly do to you here you know and it's not like that in, in wrestling or judo yeah, me, it's, me yeah it's more about manipulating the body and control oh, and again absolutely. top control a lot of the scramble yeah it's just i like watching high level again wrestling wrestling i um, do too um, I do too. I've gotten a sincere appreciation for it and it's up to my jujitsu. I have to say, I don't understand how, and this is something I talked to coach Greg Nelson about, cause he's a D one wrestler and also a black belt in jujitsu. I said, it's improving my game. I don't understand how yet, but it is. And, and some of it is the constant movement and some of it is the different holds, especially like a nogi. It's improved my nogi because the inner course. thigh hold and, and the different grips on the neck, it, it, it has improved my jujitsu. I have to say. And so you like to watch uh, MMA. Uh, do you watch uh, anything else? You watch boxing or grappling competitions or what else do you watch d- fight wise? I do. If if I can, you know, I haven't watched that much MMA lately. Just I used to buy fights all the time and I just don't buy them as much as I used to. And, and I'm looking back and the less fighting I did, the more I watched it on TV. Yeah. <laughs> and so the more I train now, it seems like I'm, I'm, I'm watching a list, but I love pride fighting, you know, with the, uh, the Muay Thai. If I can get on somebody's flow grappling account and watch ADCC, yeah. I love yeah. watching ADCC. That's cool. So, um, and, and I, I really do love Nogi. Nogi was one of the first things that really hooked me with um, jujitsu because I, you, you're going to have to have some confidence to do Nogi because of what you have to wear. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Everything Coming out like is, a superhero. It, it, yeah. It is. And, the, and something your, your, that um, women guards, have said, I, guess, yeah. yeah um, yes. For, for those of you who don't know what no gi is, it is literally wrestling, but you're not wearing a gi and you don't want to give your opponent anything they should grab onto. Now, technically they're not supposed to grab onto your shirt or your shorts, but heck it happens. And so what you do is you wear compression clothing because it doesn't let them grip and it makes you a little bit slipperier to deal with. And I've heard women say, and it was the same with me. I don't want to do no gi because I like my security blanket of the gi. Yeah. Because the ghee feels like a blanket. It literally does. It's heavy. It's several sure. pounds. 
And um, I was like, well, that's probably why I need to do no gi because it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> and I love the speed of it, especially because I am a smaller person who generally I don't get to go against people my own size. And, you know, I'm never going to outmuscle anybody. And I know that technique always beats strength. It does not. Anybody who said technique always beats strength is a big person. That's just all there is to it. <laughs> Somebody can outmuscle me any day of the week. But, you know, I've got the speed on them. And so that's something I appreciate about Nogi is just your ability to be able to switch positions and move and transition to this guard, this guard, this guard. Right. So, yeah. Do you, I like your shirt. Um, again, this is an audio oh. podcast, but your shirt has a luchador on it and it's a yeah. fight right shirt. And so mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm a big fan of professional wrestling, which is, again, the, mm-hmm. the theater, the illusion of all the stuff we're talking about, right? It's a, it's a show. Yeah. It's a show. I love that yeah. stuff. I'm, I've, I've been a pro wrestling referee in the past and stuff like this. Again, I play the role of the referee, I should say. Right. right. Um, right. You, I used to have a Kevin stuff? Nash t-shirt. Oh, Nash, man. Too sweet. Uh, big NWO. sexy. Big yeah, sexy Kevin I Nash. You just big made sexy. me smile like a dork, man. Uh, I so know. Fan? I know. But that's what I grew up with. Are you kidding? <laughs> Junkyard Dog, The oh, yeah. Hulk, yeah. Sav- you know, Macho Man Savage. Yeah. It was so different. And I do, you know, I, I wasn't watching it so much when The Rock came around, but I sure. do appreciate that because even though it's not real fighting, it is athletic. Right. There we go. It is. A, those people practice that, those gymnastics and those acrobatics. I absolutely, I do. I love pro wrestling. I haven't seen it in a long time. I can't find it on TV so much anymore. It, but that, uh, I oh, loved it. No, yeah. It's one of those things. It's a, uh, again, I, I'm such a, fight fan but also such yes. a pro wrestling fan in that yeah it's this fun version of 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 an ideal, the, the illusion of combat again and and again with it's this fun sports. kind of way yeah. it's a sports soap opera 100%. you get a whole storyline yeah. going yeah yeah it's yeah. great i love it and so i was just curious because i saw the, the lucha guy on your shirt that's yeah. super cool i dig it yeah the bottom yeah. says it's escribe libre oh, instead there. of lucha libre escribe libre <laughs> So awesome. That's great. And Um, I used to be a Spanish teacher. So this is also kind of homage to my years teaching Spanish. Oh, how cool. I'm going to invite you on again uh, because I want to do some episodes in Spanish. And so we'll. Oh, uh, no. Because I want to practice my Spanish. And so uh, I'll invite you on. We can can do that. I've been learning some Portuguese too. I've been learning some Portuguese too. And uh, the funny thing is, when, when you speak two languages, if you hear a third language, you automatically, me personally, I revert to one of my other languages. So I hear <laughs> Portuguese and I immediately want to speak back in Spanish. But sure. I've noticed that the problem was I've been mixing them up a little bit. Sure. And uh, in this gym, there are there are people who really don't speak English very well. And when I help them and I'm speaking Spanish every now and then, I'll throw in a word and I can see their head kind of go. Because the word for more in Spanish is the word but. Mm-hmm. As in the conjunction, not the part of the body sure. in in Portuguese. Oh, and right. so they're like, why? Why would you say mo- yeah. more this? I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. wrong one. No, oh, yeah. that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. I, I like uh, again a lot of MMA fighters are Brazilian, so they speak Portuguese, and so yeah. in their post fight interview, again having a, a Spanish background and, and stuff like you this, hear words. I, right. I, I, I was like, I can pick out a lot of this. I was like, I can right. pick out a lot Very of this these similar. days. Very, Very similar. similar. Same thing with Italian yeah. as well. Watch an Italian movie, yeah. and you don't have to watch. You don't have to read the subtitles all the time. Things like that. Oh yeah, it's a romance language. They're all from Latin, sure, so they're all, all going to have certain things, certain things in common. All that, all that. And so we talked about fighting stuff, and so mm-hmm. and so you have the the writing background. You said you wrote for some magazines. So like, did you do like um like journalism for the like uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu scene or or, or what? No, or, um, or... actually, um, I studied um, in college. I uh, was an English and Spanish teacher. And so I learned about writing actually to go way back before that. My father was a writer. Okay. And so from the time I was in middle school, I was, you know, typing up manuscripts for him, which was to me slave labor. And I hated it with all my heart. And I was going to be anything but a writer. I would never be a writer. Mm-hmm. What a boring job. Yeah. And uh, so then, you know, I learned about writing in college and I was an English teacher a little bit. I actually hated it so much because of the workload that I let my license lapse (laughs) (laughs) so they could only make me teach uh, Spanish. But um, I self-published a book and I've heard I've heard the, the advice, never publish your first book. And that's good advice. I need to take that book off the market and, and retool it because it is really who I was before. You know, that was me as a negative white belt 
<laughs> so and and it, and I got a job with a local magazine. I wrote color articles for them. I did ghostwriting for them. Cool. Um, I would write um, different long advertisements for people, and I just got little writing jobs here and there, advertisements, mm-hmm. writing advertisements, and and things like that. And um and then. I did short stories. I've got several short stories published here and there. And people have said, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? Well, here's the thing. The problem is I am so thankful that I get to write for Writer's Digest blog. And now I'm getting to write for Brazilian, uh, for Black Belt Magazine Jiu-Jitsu and my own blog. I've got all these little side things going so much that I'm really not focusing on a fiction book, but I have written, I have uh, three different um, fiction short stories out there in different anthologies and fiction. I, I absolutely love writing it, but I've become a nonfiction writer. Darn it. No, I think, I think that's okay. I think that's a cool I know, evolution. It's just, and again, your contribution to like the writing world came from your fight background. Absolutely. I think that the, and the blog yeah. and all this kind of stuff, I think, again, we evolve and adapt and stuff like this. Like I thought I was going right. to be the, I'm going to, Right, nonstop. I want to publish all the books. I was like, I got one oh, or yeah. two in me. I got one or two in me, and I want to do the podcast, and I want it's to so teach hard. writing, and because it's exhausting, it is. People don't have a clue. Like, and I love it. I love it so much, but it I is know. exhausting. It is so much harder because we all grow up writing. You know, we had to write our write stuff in school, and so you look at it, you're like, uh, eh, this isn't a hard thing. It is not only mentally, but it's also physically exhausting. And and I have something I call writer cam where I let my, you know, computer just take random pictures. And sometimes I may have my head in my hands. And I got that from actually writer Tosca Lee. She calls it uh, the midnight something or another. But it, she is a prolific writer. She's been on the New York, New York Times bestseller list. And you will see her on, in front of her camera at one in the morning with her face in her hands because it, it is grueling. You don't just sit down and write. You have to know where you're going. Where's your character arc? And tell me about these different characters. And and where are you going with this? And it, it, there's so much more to it than than people have a have a clue. Yeah, they, they really it's it's exhausting. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah, and I know some people will like. I write every day, and this, and I'm like, well, fucking good for you, because I can't. Great, I, good that, for you. That will make me jump out the window. High five. Okay, so I ain't gonna. Yeah. And that uh, yeah. that idea that sometimes the words don't come. The words they don't come don't. sometimes. I, I, and I, and again, there's all these little tools and tricks, and sometimes you can unlock something here and there, but sometimes you don't got a story to write. Sometimes you ain't got a sometimes poem to write, don't. and that's okay. You know, and that's when right. you read, and that's when you listen to a writing podcast or exactly. Something. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be a good writer, you gotta be a reader. Now, I will say that uh, sometimes, if I am writing a short story, uh, fiction, like sometimes when um, like small publishing houses will, uh, they're trying to get off the ground or, or they're trying to sell more books, they'll reach out to different published authors and say, "Hey, will you submit something to an anthology to kind of help them?" Sure, yeah, get solicit- you know, get out solicitations, the- yeah. Yeah. And, um, I have done, I've done a lot of that. And there are some days that I just sit down and I'm like, what the heck? And I cannot read a fiction book while I'm writing fiction because I have a habit of picking up the writing voice I'm reading. Oh, sure. Yeah. Big time. So if I'm writing a lot, I have to read nonfiction stuff. It's just, and you know, nonfiction writers do have a voice, right? But it's it's very different than it's, a fiction. Voice. I think it's a little bit less intrusive usually. You know, it is. Yes. I mean, unless you're like a, I don't know, Hunter S. Thompson or something like that. You know. Well, yeah, but, that's uh, a whole other animal. He's, he's, that's a whole other animal. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I I enjoyed this talk. This was great. Tell. Thank uh, you tell, for having me on. Tell I our audience it. about where we can find your stuff online. Okay. You can find me at fightright, F-I-G-H-T-W-R-I-T-E dot net. But if you mis- misspell it and put F-I-G-H-T-R-I-G-H-T, you'll get to me that way too. I oh, own really? both of those. You bought both those yeah. domains. Yeah, I got both girl. of those. Yeah, I did. <laughs> fightright dot net. Um, it's kind of a one-stop shop for everything. So you can uh, go through and buy my book there. I am an Amazon affiliate, just so just so you know. Uh-huh. Um and you can go to my blog. You can find out where I'm speaking. You can get in touch with me. You can find about uh, my Writer's Digest classes. If you want to take a class with Writer's Digest with me, if you put Fight10, F-I-G-H-T-1-0 in, you'll get $10 off. I am working on a series. I hope to have it done in a month. And it is about picking picking a fighting style for your character. And that's ironic because the blog post I did today 
for Writer's Digest, and I'll be talking about this in the teaching series, is most people don't know how to fight. Right. So, it, you know, if you think, oh, my character, what's their fighting style? Well, have they gone anywhere and learned? <laughs> then if they haven't, then their fighting style is whatever their natural response is inside. Right. Um, so don't think it's going to be squeaky clean. And I reference uh, the fights I broke up as a teacher. I saw a lot of fights. <laughs> I think- I'm not proud of it, but I did. Oh, I also have a podcast. That's actually how I found you Ooh. because I was going to my podcast on Spotify, which is also Fight Right. And I saw Fighters and Writers and I went, whoop, wait a minute. <laughs> and I looked at it like, this is the coolest thing. <laughs> um, on Instagram, you can do hashtag Fight Right. I put a few things out every now and then on IGTV, um, but you can follow me. Uh, hashtag Fight Right, Carla, C A R L A dot C dot Hoke, H O C H fight writer and was already taken oh. or fight right was already taken i forget what it was and it's somebody who isn't even on instagram anymore yeah I'm it's like, just like somebody please. with no post and just like give me no, that, I know. Give like, me that account give it back to me <laughs> yes yeah so that's how people can find me and my book is a uh, fight right how to write believable fight scenes with writer's digest which is now penguin random house and it's you can get an ebook or a um, hardcover yeah, I picked or up a physical book, not hardcover, physical book. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I I wanted mine immediately, so I bought the Thank you. I bought it on Amazon. Fifteen bucks for the, the Kindle version went straight to my iPad and I was able to again I jumped to a, a few specific sections uh that right. I just thought were really cool. So I appreciate that and I'm gonna keep I love the Kindle keep, version of stuff. I use the Kindle version of my book all the time to find things. No, you see the stack of books behind me, I'm trying yeah. to get rid of a bunch of these and try to and try to I just hate moving them every time, you know. Uh, do you read faster with a physical book or a Kindle book or an ebook? Sorry. Which I think I, I, I think I, I think I, I, well, lately when I do the, the Kindle, I'll also do the audio. Like I'll buy the audio <gasps> I love too. That. Like I, I was like, I don't care if I, I buy somebody's that. book twice, like, and right. then listen to it as I, and I like that. Cause I, my focus is a nightmare lately. I'm a, I'm Me a too. true mess. I am a true mess. Me too. But, uh, uh, I think I go a little bit faster in a hard copy actually. I actually oh, do really? think I go a little bit faster in a hard copy. Yeah. I reached out to Penguin Random House about, I said, well, I would like to record my book. Ooh. And they're like, well, we only have professionals do that. And I'm like, can you give me a shot? Just let me just, and they're like, nope, no go. It's got to be a professional. I'm like, okay. What does that even mean? Somebody who, what does that even they, like, um, they talk for a living. There, there may be a guild. There probably is a no, guild. No, yeah, the voice of, actors of whatever. Yeah, the voice yeah. actors guild. Yeah. And they you may know. have to use the voice actors guild for all I know, so. But yeah, I no. love the combo when you buy a Kindle book and it also has the e- uh, the audio. I love that. No, yeah, it's a it's a helpful tool for, for when my it brain is. gets weird. Yeah. Me too, because I will zone out. I will read a page and I'm like, what did I what did I just read? But if I'm listening to it, I don't do that because I'm paying attention as it's highlighting the words. Right. So right. yeah. Well, cool, Carla. Hey, well, we'll direct everybody over to the website, the blog, the podcast, et cetera. Maybe to sell some sell some books and. Improve Thank people's you. fight scenes so they don't uh, out themselves as people who haven't been punched in the face before. And That's I, right. And again, I, I, I only invite people onto the podcast that write better than me and could kick my ass. And so... Uh, yeah, I don't, I, you, I think, you may have made a mistake here, I think, buddy. I think you got me you on may both, have made a mistake, maybe. my friend. <laughs> yeah. Regardless. You'll, don't be so you'll, sure. You'll choke me out, I'm sure. All right. Hey, well, well, we'll send everybody over to your social media. And thanks again for doing this. Thank you so much, AJ. Have a good day. You too. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening to that interview. Thanks for listening to the show. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Carla Hoke. She's a just a cool person and just very well-rounded in terms of just the knowledge that she possesses. Like, it's just pretty cool to uh, be able to have a conversation with somebody like that. Again, she is the author of Fight Right, How to Write Believable Fight Scenes. She's also on Instagram, Carla C. Oak. That's, that link's going to be in the show notes. You can also follow Fight Right, hashtag Fight Right, over on Instagram. The blog is fightright.net. You can go to your internet browser, fightright.net. If you're interested in uh, courses with uh, Writer's Digest University, you get a discount code. If you use FIGHT10 at checkout, you get 10% off. Why not? Save you the tax, right? 
All right, y'all. And again, thanks for listening to my quick recap of the Saul Canelo Alvarez versus Billy Joe Saunders boxing match. It was a fun one. Great production. Very cool. All right, y'all. Be good. Be safe. Take care of each other. And we'll talk next week. <laughs>